glad that you are with us today for week two of this series uh, called Jesus Stories. And uh, the truth is, um, everything that we preach out of the Bible is a Jesus story, okay? Uh, because you, you have to understand that everything from uh, Genesis to Revelation all point to Jesus. And, uh, but what I love about this series is we're able to just kind of hone in specifically on some stories out of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the four books of the New Testament that all tell directly the story of, of the life of Jesus according to four different uh, men. And um, we're using the television series, The Chosen, and we'll, we're showing a clip from that every single week, so we'll be doing that. We did it last week, I, I believe, with the woman with the issue of blood who came to Jesus. And I am excited about what I get to share with you today, but before we uh, look at the clip, I want to read the story from Mark chapter 1, Mark chapter 1, verse 40, and we'll read down through verse 45. And it says simply this, a man with leprosy came and knelt in front of Jesus, begging to be healed. He said, if you are willing, you can heal me and make me clean. <clears throat> Moved with compassion, everybody say compassion, <laughs> Jesus reached out and touched him. I am willing, he said, be healed. Instantly, the leprosy disappeared, and the man was healed. And Jesus sent him on his way with a stern warning. Don't tell anyone about this. Instead, go to the priest and let him examine you. Take along the offering required in the law of Moses for those who have been healed of leprosy. This will be a public testimony that you've been cleansed. cleansed. But the man went and spread the word, proclaiming to everyone what had happened. As a result, large crowds soon surrounded Jesus, and he couldn't publicly enter a town anywhere. In fact, he had to stay out in secluded places. Another translation says in lonely places. But still, people from everywhere kept coming to him. A man with leprosy came and knelt in front of Jesus. I actually went and looked in the other Gospels that this story is told. It's told in all three of what is called the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Um, and, and I looked in Mark's account of the story, or Matthew's. I looked in Luke's account of the story, and I could find really no more information about this man than Mark tells us. Mark doesn't tell us anything about his background. He does not tell us who his dad was. He doesn't tell us if he had any kids, if he, was, if he was married. He doesn't tell us what color his hair was or what color his eyes were. He just didn't even tell us his, his name. I mean, he didn't have the common courtesy of at least sharing his name. This is like literally one of the first specific miracles recorded by Mark, and he doesn't even have the common courtesy to tell us the man's name. I mean, I, I, I go eat at a restaurant, I find out, you know, the waiter's, waitress's name, right? Um, and I'm not good with names. Anybody not good with names in the room? All right, yeah, I think I'm not the only one. Uh, I mean, I asked the waitress's name, I, I don't remember her name. I, I asked Alicia, what did she say her name was? But, but Mark could have at least told us his name. Doesn't tell us his name, but he does tell us his condition. Doesn't share with us his name but does share with us his issue. It goes to show that sometimes our identity can be consumed by our issue. We can come to be known more by what we did than who we are. Leprosy was a horrible disease. It was a bacterial infection that would affect all parts of your body would affect the nerves, the nerve endings. It would affect your eyes, your, 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 your nose, your, your skin. And in the first century, it was, it was incurable. And it was a dreaded, fearful disease because it would ultimately lead to death. 
It was also considered highly, highly contagious. And leprosy would begin with, with, with pain. It would be painful at the very beginning, but ultimately... Um, numbness would set in because your nerves were affected and you would get to a place where actually um, the, the leper couldn't feel any pain. And, and in some ways that was devastating because you would get too close to a fire and you would burn yourself and you would not know you were burning yourself or you would cut yourself. You would not know that you had cut yourself if someone didn't point out that you were bleeding and, and people would have infectious sores. Lepers would all over their bodies, their eyebrows, their eyelashes would, would fall out. And, and, and oftentimes, lepers would lose parts of their body. They would lose their hands. They would lose maybe fingers, uh, noses. It was a gruesome sight to behold. And, and there was also a, 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 an odor that went along with this sickness and once a, someone was diagnosed with leprosy, it didn't matter if they were nobility or if they were a commoner. It didn't matter if they were a man, woman, uh, a child. They were essentially banished. They had, to, they had to leave. They had to go live outside the city gates. They were quarantined, if you will. And we didn't know anything about that until about four years ago. But now we all understand the concept of Quarantine, but they weren't just quarantined for seven days or ten days or randomly four days. Um, they, they were quarantined for forever. As long as they had leprosy, they were quarantined. And, 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 and in addition to that, they, uh, they, they would have to cry out if, if they were ever close to anyone who did not have leprosy or someone were to approach them, they would have to cry, cry out, unclean, uh, uh, unclean, so as to keep people away from them. Family could not come and visit them. Family perhaps could come and bring food for them, but they would have to drop it and then leave, and then the leper could come and pick up the food. You imagine trying to explain to a small child, right? Uh, Dad's right over there, or Mom's right over there, but you can't get close to her. No, you can't go and, and hug her, so... So the greatest pain of this particular disease is actually not physical because of the numbness. It was more emotional pain due to the isolation. So now that you understand a little bit more about this disease, you, you can kind of wrap your mind around the phrase that Mark told us, a man, and a, a man with no name, came and knelt in front of Jesus, a man who had leprosy. Let's look at the clip. It's a leper. Stay back. Cover your mouth. Don't breathe his air. Don't come any closer. It's okay, John. It's okay. Rabbi, 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 you can't know this disease. You can't. Please. Please don't turn away from me. I won't. Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Only if you want to, I submit to you. My sister, she was a servant at the wedding. She told me what you could do. I know you can heal me if you are willing.
thank you. I, I knew it. I knew it. I knew it. What can I, what can I ever do? No. Do not say anything to anyone. You don't seek your own honor? Please just do me this one thing. But what do I tell people? Go. Show your result to the priest. Let them inspect you and see that you are cleansed. Make the proper offering in the temple as Moses commanded. And go on your way. <sighs> Who has an extra tunic? Just one of you, just one of you. That's enough. Green is definitely your color. <laughs> Not too shabby. <laughs> So throughout Scripture, I, I want to point this out from the beginning. Throughout Scripture, <clears throat> leprosy was a metaphor for sin. And in all honesty, this story right here is, is a beautiful picture of the gospel. The gospel. Jesus touching the untouchable. Jesus loving the unlovable. No one would get close to a leper. You were, you were terrified to get close to because they're unclean, you know. And you can see it, you can see it in, in the story, and yet Jesus walks right up and touches the one that nobody else is willing to touch. And that's that is the beautiful picture of the gospel. And listen, I know that most of us don't have sores on our skin that is evident today, but we do have sores on our soul. We have secret spots, if you will, on our soul. Certainly, some of the, the issues and the struggles in our life does manifest itself, and you can see it visibly, but so much of the issues that we wrestle with, we keep them hidden, right? You can't really see them very well, and yet, at the same time, those spots on our soul have a tendency to isolate us, to numb us sometimes. Have you ever felt like you were just so deep in something that you couldn't get out of that you almost became numb? And over time, it just breaks you. And for some, your issue has become your identity. The mistakes that you have made in your past have kind of become who you are. Your, your, your history is, is hijacking the future that God has for your life. But listen to me. Jesus did not die for you to stay bound. But he carried a cross so that you would be set free. He did not come to this earth for your present identity to be consumed by your broken past. But he came so that you would be brand new. Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, this means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. Doesn't that sound good? The old life is gone and a new life has begun. The gospel. The gospel. I, I want to, as we put ourselves in the position today of the leper, because although we all... Um, clearly play the role of those disciples as well sometimes, right? Sometimes we play that role. Uh, you're not Jesus in the story, but you might be the disciples sometimes. But today, I, I want you to see yourself as the leper today because every single one of us have been in a position and will be in the future in a, in a position where we need, we desperately need God and we have to come to him as the leper did. So let's look at four things the leper did. The first thing was he believed for his miracle. It's clear. And he believed Jesus could heal him. We don't know his name. We know his issue. And we know that at some point he heard about 
Jesus. And this story, it's his, it's his sister. It's, it's, you know, that's kind of reading between the lines, and that's fine. Somehow, he heard about Jesus. At some point, he began to hear. Everybody see hear. He heard the good news. He had, he had received so much bad news. You've got leprosy. You can't come back. Maybe trying to return to the priest. Maybe thought he got a little bit better and the priest said, no, no, you're, you're still unclean. You, bad news. He, things just got worse and worse and worse. But at some point, he, he started hearing some new news. And that new news was good news. Romans 10 and verse 14 says, how can they call on him to save them unless they believe in him? But how can they believe in him if they have never heard about him? How can they hear about him unless someone tells them? This is the significance of you sharing your faith story. This is the significance of, of a series like Jesus Stories and an Easter weekend coming up and you sharing your story and inviting someone to church. Like you, you look around and say, man, I wish somebody would tell them about Jesus. And Jesus is looking at you going, I wish you would tell them about Jesus. Like, who's going to tell them? You're going to tell them. How can they believe if they haven't heard? And how are they going to hear if someone doesn't tell them? Now, if you'll get them to the house, we'll share the gospel. But before you get them here, why don't you share your gospel? Share your story. Tell them, as someone told the leper, tell them what Jesus has done for you. And so the leper begins to believe that if, if he did it for them, then surely they can do it for, for me. Romans 10 and 17, three verses later, Paul said, so faith actually comes from hearing. Faith comes from hearing. Hearing, hearing the good news about Christ. Faith does not begin by seeing. In fact, often faith is completely in spite of what we see. It's the word of God that we have heard, that we know to be true. It's not what we've seen. It's what God has said that we have heard all throughout the scriptures, all throughout the Bible, literally from the creation story on. There's a pattern of, 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 of good news being heard before it's experienced. Like the sound coming first. Even in creation, God created the world. How did he create the world? He spoke and the world was formed. He said, let there be light. And then there was light. But the word came before the miracle. He heard it. They, we, the world heard it in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 2, when the church began that we are still part of today. Suddenly there was a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. The sound was first. Then the spirit fell, and all manner of miracles took place. But first it was a sound. Our, our, our faith is activated based on what we hear. Here And at some point, this, this um, leper began to hear good news. People saying, I, I've never met someone like this. There was literally uh, these basins of water, and he turned it into wine. I, I was sick, and now I'm not sick anymore. I've never met him, and I've never heard a rabbi that taught like this. And, and when, when the leper heard that... Perhaps in the moment he was just like, huh. But maybe he goes and lays down one evening and he starts to think about what he heard. And faith begins to build in his heart as he lies there and thinks about it. And then he says something like, well, if he did it for them, then why couldn't he do it for me? Like if he did it one time, then why could he not do it again? He heard and he believed. What are you listening to? Who are you listening to? It matters what you are lending your ear to. Are you listening to the haters and the naysayers, the provocators, the ones who actually don't want you to be healed? They don't want you to find salvation because the moment that you take a step forward, it just shines a brighter light on how broken they are. So they would rather keep you broken where they're broken. 
and, 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 and I don't, 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 that whole church thing, I tried all that church business. This whole Jesus thing, it's not even for real. What voices are you listening to? Uh, Mason and I were in an airport about a year ago, and we were trying to catch a flight. We were actually leaving here. We were trying to get I know, somewhere on the East Coast, and, and uh, we were in Terminal B there at San Antonio International Airport, and we were down on the end uh, of one of those terminals, and there's nowhere to sit. I mean, there's people everywhere, and there's a little bit of a delay because I think it was, you know, misting rain in Chicago, and and so we had a delay here, and I, we're sitting off to the side, and I'm not wanting to miss the gate announcements. I, I want to hear every word that they're saying because I got a connection to make, and 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 we're sitting there, we can't hear anything, and sure enough, the girl comes on. This is a gate change announcement for Harley Turfer, and I'm, I, I can't hear what she's saying. I can't hear what she's saying. There was the girl sitting right across from us who was on her phone. Actually, she didn't. She had headphones in. Maybe that's why she was yelling so loud. I know, girl. Can you believe? And I, like, are you the? You think you're the only person in the airport right now? <laughs> and so, so what did I have to do? I had to actually get up and, and leave the distractions, the things that I'm hearing is not what I need to be hearing. I had to move so that I could hear the announcement that I needed to hear so that I would not miss my moment. And sure enough, I needed to hear that announcement. Some of us need to remove some things from our life so that we don't miss the word of God in our life, so that we don't miss the moment that God has for us or the miracle that God has for us. He could have been listening to any voices, but he chose to listen to good news. Listen, if we're going to navigate 2024, y'all, we're going to have to be listening to the right voices. If we're going to, if we're going to navigate this crazy culture um, in 2024, we're going to have to be listening to the right voices. I've got to hear the good news about Jesus. I've got to hear the word of God. We have got to tune our ear to the voice of God. This man's testimony is like so many people in the room. He wanted to change. He did not want to be, watch this, in the condition that he was in. But he was stuck. He knew he could not do anything about it himself. It's a place we've got to get to. He was stuck. He didn't know what to do. He didn't want to be addicted. He didn't want to be angry. He didn't want to be bitter. He didn't want to be carrying that Unforgiveness. He didn't want to be bound by fear, but he could not get better until he heard some new news. And, and just like, man, I feel like the angels who came to the shepherds on the, the night that Jesus was born and said, I'm bringing you good news of great joy. I want to share some good news for you today. You might have been hearing bad news, a lot of bad news, one bad report after another. Let me, let me give you some good news so that it'll build your faith. You've been wrestling with sickness in your body. Psalm 103 says, He forgives all of your sins and He heals all your diseases. That's good news. You've been dealing with fear. Maybe when you try to sleep at night or you wake up in the middle of the night with fear. Psalm 27.1 says, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Why should I be afraid? The Lord is my fortress protecting me from danger. Why should I tremble? You've been wrestling with financial difficulties. Philippians 4.19, there's some good news. It says, My God will meet all of your needs according to the riches of his glory. Maybe you've come to church today and you feel like you've been in a fight. You've just kind of been in a spiritual struggle. 1 John 4 and 4 gives us some good news. It says, the one who is in us is greater than the one who is in the world. That's some good news for you today. I hope you receive that. I hope you let that build your faith today. We need to hear good news and believe that good news. Believe that good news. He believed it so much that, number two, he took a step. <laughs> he took a step. Can you imagine the leper who's been banished, who's been quarantined, who knows he's not supposed to get close to anyone, much less this, this rabbi, this healer from, from Galilee? Can you imagine how hard it was to take the first step? Sometimes the first step is the hardest step. The decision that you have to make, all right, I know that I, I, need, I need some help. 
And, and so I, I've got to take that first step, that first decision to, you know, attend Discover Now and get connected. To, to, instead of just living in the periphery of the family of God, to actually get connected to the family of God. That, that first step to just make the decision to join that small group and then actually attending that, that first small group. Sometimes that, that's the hardest step. Can you imagine that day? Man, Alicia and I were, went on a vacation a few years ago, and we took an excursion that was uh, not very clear. It wasn't really clear what we were going to do. It just looked fun. It was something about sliding down waterfalls in the rainforest. That sounds like a lot of fun, right? And um, we, we, it said you got to be kind of, I think it was like semi, they used some phrase, I don't remember what it was, but. Essentially, it was you need to be at least semi-athletic, and I'm like, well, I'm, I'm semi-athletic, and uh, you know, we get on the van, we're driving that way, and I'm looking around, going, well, I know I'm more athletic than these people, so um, people will surprise you, though. I'll, I'll be honest with you, they will surprise you. You don't always look athletic, and they, they, you're way more athletic than I thought. But we got up to the top, like we climbed up a mountain, like I got this, I'm climbing, I can do this. We climbed up. You know, through the jungle, all these trails, and get to the top, and, and we're gonna, you know, slide down these chutes um, in in these in, in 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 the in the rainforest, and it was it was fun. But the first thing we had to do was, and I didn't know this was coming. No one said anything about jumping off of a off of a cliff that was about 15. One of them was 15, 16. One was about 20 feet, um, and and I, you know that doesn't sound like a lot, but it is. Get up there and look at it, and then you'll see. You'll see what I'm talking about. And for a guy who's terrified of heights, it's just not, it's just not something you know, I want to do. Um, and, and that was the first thing. And I was like, well, this is the first thing we're doing? <laughs> Nobody said anything about jumping. I don't do heights. I don't do them. And, um, and, and, but Alicia got up there, and, and I, I allowed her to go first. <laughs> I didn't want her to, I didn't want to leave her up on the rock. You know, I needed to be there for her while she was there. So I allowed her to go first, and then after she went, I, I kind of half expected her not to do it, and then I would, you know, I'd have to take her down the mountain, because we, we, we're not going to be able to do this. Uh, but she did it, and then I had to do it, and uh, I, I'll never forget that step, just standing there, sh I mean, literally, just, <laughs> I don't do these kind of sorts of things. I didn't, I, you know, I, I, when I was 16, maybe, because of peer pressure, but I don't do peer pressure anymore. You know, I, I don't do things because of that anymore. Um, but they were standing there, and I, you know, everybody had pretty much jumped in except for one woman who had chickened out, and everybody else had jumped in, and except for me. And the guy was like, "Okay, you can only stand here so long." And so finally, it got to the point where he was like, well, "I'm going to count to three, and then you're going to jump." Okay. And it was one, two, three, and he pretty much pushed me. I don't know if I even jumped, but um, I literally felt like I had a heart attack on the way down. But a small, just a small one. But that first step is, that first step is 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 mortifying. It's the same way in our relationship with God and our journey with Christ. You got to just make the decision. Get through the fear. Get, get through the pain. The enemy telling you, don't do this. It's not going to turn out. Everybody's going to be angry at you. You know you're not supposed to approach anyone in your condition. People like that don't go to church. People like you don't raise their hand. People like you don't come down for prayer. The enemy telling you all of these things. But I'm encouraging you to push through and take that first step. The enemy wants you to stay hidden, stay isolated. But listen, while isolation might keep other people from seeing you as you really are, it also keeps you from seeing God as he really is and the freedom that you can really have from him. And it's much safer for you to take a step toward God than to hide behind some image of what you want people to think of you. What God requires from you is going, what, what, what God has for you is going to require movement from you. You're going to have to take a step. Take a step. So he took a step in verse 40. It says the, the man with leprosy came and he knelt in front of Jesus. He knelt, begged to be healed. He said, if you are willing, you can heal me and make me clean. He knelt in front of Jesus. He knelt. And he revealed his weakness and his issue to Jesus. 
the third thing he did? He revealed his issue. I'm, I'm unclean. I know that you can if you will. This is the posture that if we're going to receive a miracle from God, this is the posture that we have to get to. As long as we're walking around like this, we're not going to receive our miracle. And you can have secret spots all over your soul. You can come to church every single weekend. You can be in five small groups and have spots everywhere and walk around like this. And I don't know it, but he knows it, and you know it. So until you get in this posture, I can't do it. I, I, I've tried. I've tried to plan. I've, 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 I've made phone calls. I've tried to spend money. I just thought because of who my dad was that it wasn't. We have all of these reasons not to get in this posture. But until we get in this posture, we will not receive healing. The woman with the issue of blood that Pastor Jim preached about last week in order to receive her healing. What did she do? She pressed through the crowd. But then the Bible says she touched the hem of his garment. This is the posture to receive healing. When, when, when Peter and John and then Mary came to the empty tomb on Resurrection Sunday morning that we're going to celebrate here in a few weeks, all three of them, the Bible says, bent down and looked into the tomb. You can't have an encounter with the resurrection unless you're willing to bend low. You can't have it. We have to get in that position of, I, I, I can't do this, Lord. I am desperate. I absolutely wholeheartedly know that I can't do it, but I know you can. Listen, he's the answer to every problem that you have. Anything going on in your, in your life, the Bible says he's the alpha and he's the omega, which means he's the, the A and the Z. That's, that's the, the, the first and last letter of the, of the Greek alphabet. He's the alpha and the omega. He's the, he's the author, Paul said, and the finisher of our faith. So if he's the author of my faith, if he instigates my story, and he's the finisher of my story, then listen, wherever I am in between, he's right there with me, and he has the answer to, to accomplish, to meet every need that I have, no matter what I want come up against. If it's a family situation, if it's a kid situation, if it's an addiction situation, he's the answer to every question that I have. I've just got to posture myself to receive from him. And verse 41, I love this, moved with compassion. Jesus reached out and touched him. I'm willing to be healed. Moved with compassion. I love this word, compassion. It comes from a, a Greek word, splenizomai. I'm not going to try to spell it. I mean, I could because I have it right here. It doesn't matter. But splenizomai means, is, is a very layered, textured word. It means a lot more than just compassion. In fact, the, the, the translators tried to come up with, you know, a really good word, English word. And in and, and, and the NIV, just in the NIV, this is New Living Translation, but in NIV, it's translated as indignant. Jesus was indignant. And we see indignant as angry. And, and, and truthfully, splenizomai means um, frustrated. It, 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 it literally means something that you feel. Deep inside your bones. Like it's like from your guts. It's, it's how you feel deep inside. So Jesus feeling deep within. So it does mean compassion. It does mean frustration. Frustrated and sad that this man had had to deal with this condition for all of this time. Frustrated at what it has done, had done to his life. Probably frustrated with his disciples for trying to keep him away. And feeling this love and compassion for the man. He felt for the leper. Like he felt for him. And, and, and this becomes much more meaningful when you remember that one of the first signs of leprosy is that you lose your sense of feeling. And so this man, who has lost the ability to feel, is touched by a Savior who is feeling 
for him. Hebrews 4 and 15 says, For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. He feels for us. He feels your pain. He identifies with your loneliness. He identifies with your struggle. He feels for you. And then I love that Jesus goes on after healing him and tells him in verse 44, don't tell anybody about this. But the man went and spread the word, proclaiming to everyone what had happened. I mean, Jesus had that whole back to the future thing down, right? He was, he's, he was, you know, Marty McFly. He knew that the man was going to tell. He told him not to, but he knew he was. He healed him anyway. <laughs> I hadn't said this in any other services, but he, he knows that you're not going to be perfect in the future, but he's healing you today anyway. He knows who we are. And you, you, you talk about this one of a couple of ways. One, one way is that when the man was healed, he, he, had, like he had to tell people. When, when Jesus touches you in a way that nobody else can touch you, when he changes you in a way that nobody else can change you, you just cannot keep that story to yourself. you got to tell everybody you come in contact. You're picking up the phone. You're going through your call list. You're telling your mama, your brother, your sister, your kids, your neighbors. Let me tell you what Jesus did for me. Like you don't have to be taught like a three-point evangelism lesson. This is how you share your faith. You just share your faith. You just tell people what he, I was blind and now I see. I was broken and now I'm healed. I was a leper and now, look, look. Just share. You, you can't help but share your faith. But I want, I want to show you this. The man went and spread the word, proclaiming to everyone what had happened. As a result, large crowds soon surrounded Jesus. And he couldn't publicly enter a town. I want you to see a parallel here. He had to stay out in the secluded places. When the story started, the leper was the one in the lonely place that couldn't go into town. But by the time it's over, Jesus was where the leper had been. Jesus took his place. He took his place. Before, the leper couldn't go into town. Now he can. But now Jesus can't go into town. This is a beautiful picture of the gospel of Jesus. He took my sin. In the fullness of time, God sent his son to be born of a virgin. Why? For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whosoever believes in him should not perish. Jesus took my sin. As a matter of fact, 2 Corinthians 5 and 21, for God made Christ, who never sinned, to be the offering of for our sin, to take our place so that we could be made right with God through Christ. He didn't just come to heal the leper's skin. He came to heal his life. He didn't just come to heal your issue. But he came to heal your soul. This is the gospel. This is who Jesus is. Now, what step do you need to take today? I've shared some good news. I hope that faith has been activated in your heart and your life. Listen, don't live in isolation. Take a step today. Would you close your eyes? Let me, let me pray for you. Jesus, thank you for your word that's so rich, so real, so anointed. I pray that you would move in whole hearts and minds today. <clears throat> that you would minister. Those that are in the room, hiding secret spots. Lord, I don't have to see it, but you already know it's there. I pray that you would give them the courage to take a step, to humble themselves under your mighty hand so that they could find freedom so that they could find healing. In Jesus' name, give us the courage to take the step that we need to take. Whatever that step looks like. 
as I continue to pray, if you're in the room and you're not in a relationship with Jesus, at every location, I want to give you a chance to surrender your life to Jesus, to surrender your life to him. Maybe you've never taken that step. Or maybe you know today that you need to rededicate your life to Jesus. This moment is for you. And I want to remind you of what we saw of a leper who came to Jesus, who even while he still had a disease covered with sores, Jesus reached out and touched him. He's not afraid to touch you in your current condition. He loves you just like you are. He accepts you just like you are. He just loves you too much to leave you the way that you are. He wants to bring healing and hope and life to you. You don't have to get everything together and then come to Jesus. No, 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 no. You come to him just as you are. So if you're in the room at any of our locations or you're watching online and you'd say, Jonathan, that's me. I need to surrender my life to Jesus today, whether it's for the first time or you need to rededicate. Will you throw a hand in the air right now? Let me see it. Come on. Nobody's looking around. Heads bowed, eyes closed, hands all over the... Come on, Midtown. Come on, Boy Birdie. Leave them up, please, if you don't mind. I want to see every hand. Thank you, Stone Oak. Leave them up. Leave them up. Hands all over the building. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, you can put your hands down now. Hey, I'm going to pray a simple prayer of surrender. I invite everybody to pray this prayer along with me. You can use your words or mine. Lord Jesus, I surrender my life to you today. God, I'm starting over. I'm making a fresh start today. I repent, Jesus. I ask you to forgive me for my sins. God, I'm turning around and I'm following you. I believe in you. I believe you gave your life for me and that you rose from the grave. And today I'm making a fresh start with you, making you Lord of my life. It's in Jesus' name that I pray. Come on, and everybody said amen. Big hand for everybody who took that step of faith, y'all. Yeah.